welcome. It truly is a joy and an honor to be here to do a 30-hour course in 18 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and a difficult course at that. A short walk to genocide. Uh, my parenting has now come full circle. Uh, my children are now grown, and I am watching in absolute wonder, delight, and tremble, tremble as I see my own children raising my grandchildren, uh, that next generation. My work has also come full circle. I began uh, educating parents and educators on how to raise responsible, resourceful, resilient, compassionate human beings who knew how to think, not just what to think who would stand up for values and against injustices, who were not easily led, who didn't do to please, who had what the great scientist Carl Sagan said, the gift of wonder and skepticism, the why and the wow, that all three-year-olds possess. Mom, look at the spaghetti. Mom, look at the dandelion. Look at that cliff, wow. And why, 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 why? My goal was to have 16-year-olds have that sense of wonder. They tend not to harm themselves and others when they do. And the skepticism when their friends say, let's go vandalize that building, that they would say, why? And then I asked Stephen Lewis, don't ever ask Stephen Lewis, <laughs> if you can help him. You will end up in Africa. Uh, seriously, though, I was grateful for the path he helped put me on. I work in Rwanda now with orphans from the 1994 genocide, where in 100 days, almost a million human beings were slaughtered by family members, by neighbors, by brothers and sisters, by parents. As the world watched on in indifference and utter contempt, over that ethnic rivalry that was going on. Mislabeled, of course. And then on one of my trips, I was asked to speak at the University of Rwanda in Butari. The topic, schoolyard bullying. <laughs> I was going to be talking to a group of new educators on the bully, the bullied, and those not so innocent bystanders. And I said to the instructor, you would like me to come to a university where 11 years before, half the staff helped kill the other half. And classmates were complicit in the death of their seatmate. And you would like me to talk about schoolyard bullying. <laughs> I would love the opportunity, if you will allow me to demonstrate that it is a short walk from schoolyard bullying the taunting, the shunning, the rumor, the gossip, that punch to a hate crime, to genocide. Genocide is not an unimaginable horror. It was thoroughly imagined, meticulously planned, and brutally executed by people who had identified other human beings as its, not human beings. Martin Buber said, I am I and you are thou. I'm unique and you're unique, and we each have a gift to bring to the common humanity, the we. We are interdependent, interrelated, and interconnected, unless, of course, I make you an it. In Nazi Germany, they didn't kill Jews. They killed vermin and bacteria eating at the fabric of our society. They didn't kill Tutsis in Rwanda, they killed cockroaches. Cambodians, worms, Armenians, dogs. What do you do with vermin? You exterminate them. But it didn't start in the killing fields of Cambodia, and it didn't start with the Hutu powers machetes or the Nazis' death camps. It started in the schoolyard. When a kid would call another kid a fag, a queer, a slut, or a whore, a cockroach, stupid, fatso, dumb, that's where it starts. 
Bullying is not a conflict. Conflict's normal, natural, and necessary. Bullying is none of that. Bullying is a conscious, willful, deliberate, hostile activity intended to harm where you get pleasure from somebody else's pain. It's arrogance in action. It's utter contempt for another human being. And once I have contempt for you, I can do anything to you and not feel any shame or compassion. I won't have that empathy for you. I can take a Matthew Shepard, beat him up, tie him to a fence post, leave him to die in Laramie, Wyoming. And when those two young boys were arrested, they said, yeah, but he was gay. Take a black man in Jasper, Texas, James Byrd, drag him on the back of a pickup till he's decapitated. And when those three young boys were arrested, they said, yeah, but he was black. Renee Verk, 15 years old. 100 kids knew about her death in British Columbia before her parents or the police. Some of those kids cheered those kids on as they broke her arms before they drowned her. And one of those young people said, yeah, but she was brown and ugly and fat. I didn't like her. The other said, ooh, I couldn't stand the sound of her voice. You see, it is a short walk. So where do we begin to break this horrific cycle of violence? What I felt I needed to do in order to see how to break it in bullying was to look at the worst crime we can commit against one another, and that's the crime of genocide. Herbert Kelman said there are three conditions for a genocide, and if any of these exist in our homes, our schools, our communities, we have fertile soil for a genocide. Unquestioning obedience to authority. And you will only see one screen in front of me today, because I want you to burn that image in your minds. Unquestioning obedience to authority, and I don't think so. <laughs> Unquestioning obedience to authority, that's why it is critical that we teach this next generation how to think, not just what to think. I want them to question everything. I want to ask, what's the Mexican version of the Alamo? You know, it's a different story. <laughs> I want them to ask why the Battle of Little Bighorn and Custer's Last Stand happened at the same time, same place, same people, but different stories. I want them to ask why Laura Secord's a heroine here in Canada and a traitor in the US for the same <laughs> deed. She's not just a piece of chocolate. <laughs> she warned the Brits in the War of 1812. And I want young people to ask, why can you go forward in time, forward in space, backwards in space, but not backwards in time? Say, what does that have to do with all of this? I want young people to understand, you spread an ugly rumor about someone on the internet, you can't get it back. There is no overs. You have committed social assassination. And that doesn't get repaired. So I want them to question. I want them to ask, what's one plus one? Two. Always? <laughs> ah, it could be 11. <laughs> and it, are we in the binary system or base 10? And one, one is dog in Japanese. You see, I want kids thinking outside the box. And that's why they have to get out of their own little boxes and be able to walk in somebody else's shoes. They have to be able to see the world with wonder and skepticism. And I want them to question us because step one, the first ingredient for a genocide is to have a group of people who will not question. The second is the routinization of cruelty. Where cruelty becomes so routine, it becomes the norm. Where the unimaginable becomes conceivable, then the conceivable becomes real. And I'm often asked if I'm concerned about the violence our kids are exposed to. I am. I am concerned about the virtual violence and the non-virtual violence. <laughs> Because whether it's real or imagined in our lives, it impacts us. But I'm also just as concerned about the humor our kids are exposed to. 
Bill Cosby said it so beautifully. I do miss the days when comedy wasn't mean, when it wasn't at the expense of another human being. I send young people home and say, watch your favorite show and write down every time you hear someone laughing at someone, not with them. Remember, bullying is getting pleasure from somebody else's pain. And in a hate crime, the glee in smashing the windows in Kristallnacht. And in a genocide, going to work, yielding namasu, and the machete, singing a song. Getting pleasure from somebody else's pain. How else can you machete a baby? So the routinization of cruelty, where it becomes such a norm that our children are swimming in a culture of mean. And the last is the dehumanization of another human being, making them into an it. And then I don't have to worry. I can be a, a nice person and be mean to the it, to exterminate the it. And that's why in the wilderness, we must begin to see nature not as it either. So we need to begin to look at the routinization, the dehumanization, and the unquestioning obedience to authority because that sets the scene. And I want young people, when that high status social bully says to all the other girls, I don't like the new girl, you want to be in my group? Don't eat lunch with her. I want your daughter to be the one to say, that's me. That's cruel. And have the courage. And it does take courage to go sit next to the new girl. She's not going to get all those scratch and sip stickers and stars, catch and be a good lunch with the principal awards. She'll probably get old Miss Goody Two-Shoes or you're next. And I want your sons, when their friends say, look at that kid over there. Different skin color, religion, gender, physical or mental ability. The big five for hate crimes, what makes a hate crime different than any other crime? It's criminal bullying. Let's go mess him up. I want your son to be the one to say, no. When the burden's heavy, when his friends say, what are you, chicken? What do you just like him? No. But how on earth do we begin to raise a generation who can be what I call the brave-hearted? They're not the bully. They're not the bullied. And they're not those not-so-innocent bystanders. But they become a fourth character in this drama, the character in the picture. The kid willing to be a witness, resistor, and defender. Brave-hearted doesn't imply just being kind. Although we must be kind to be brave-hearted, it, it requires that courage to step up and to speak out at cost to yourself. Now, after we've set the scene and we have those characters, we have to watch how those characters play. In the center, we have the target. Notice I don't say victim. Target implies that the problem isn't with that person. It's with the people perpetrating the harm. So the target is in the center. At the very top is the bully. Now, there are a variety of roles bullies can play. They can be the instigator the perpetrator, and the planner. A man was finally extradited from Canada after 12 years in this country on level one genocide charges in Rwanda because he ran the hate radio station. And he kept protesting, but I didn't kill anybody. But it was his songs they sang when they wielded the masu and the machete. So there are a variety of roles they can play. Then you have the bully's henchmen. Those are the people who will do the bully's bidding. That young girl that wants to fit in and be in that popular crowd so she does whatever that bully tells her to do, even if it violates her ethical tenets, because I've got to fit in. Then you have the active supporters. They are the ones who whip out their cell phones and video it, but say, I didn't do that to that kid. I only put it up on YouTube. So that the third character and the fourth character, the passive onlooker, can watch it on the screen and say, but I didn't do that. Oh, but isn't that funny what they did to her? 
And at the very bottom is a deadly lot, the disengaged onlooker. And on the world scene, that can be you and me who turn a blind eye, who say, well, it's not my yard. I mean, but there's ethnic rivalry. They've been fighting forever. And say, well, it's part of growing up. Boys will be boys. Girls just want to be mean. See, it's not such a big leap. On the upswing, we have the potential witness. That's the kid you did raise to act with integrity and civility and compassion. But she's afraid to step in. She's afraid if she does something, she'll make it worse for herself or for the kid that was targeted. Or she's just simply afraid. But at the very top, across from the bully, is what I'd like every one of your young people to be, that witness, resistor, and defender. But how do you treat hired help? How do you treat somebody moving through the grocery store a little slower than you'd like them to? <laughs> how do you treat that new neighbor who looks different than you? Who wears different clothing? English is not their first language. They even smell different because of the diet they have. Their culture, cultural traditions are different. Your children are watching. You see, hate is not normal, natural, or necessary. It's a learned behavior. The song from South Pacific, they have to be carefully taught to hate before you're six, seven, or eight, to hate the people your relatives hate. So if it's learned, we have to watch the teaching we're doing here. And when that bigoted relative at the family gathering starts spewing racist and sexist comments thinly disguised as jokes, can you say, I'm bothered by that, or that was racist, or that was sexist, or that was ugly, when all your other relatives roll their eyes and say, what, can't you take a joke? Not that kind. And you know you've had an impact when you walk back in the dining room and everybody shuts up. <laughs> but you've had an even greater impact when your mother says, look, he's old, let it go. No, age is no excuse for intolerance. Your children will see you doing what you are asking them to do in the lunchroom, to stand up for a value and against an injustice when it's uncomfortable to do. Because we must look at the everyday. We must maintain that skepticism and wonder. A dear classmate of mine, I went to school with him from grade school, he went off to be a priest, I went off to be a nun. I'm obviously no longer a nun with a husband and three kids. <laughs> uh, and no, I didn't marry a priest, and yes, I met him after I left the convent, so that'll answer you Catholics' questions for the day. <laughs> um, but Byron and I grew up together, and Byron was arrested in an act of civil disobedience at the School of the Americas, protesting the teaching of torture. And he sent all of us a letter because he and the three nuns uh, were going off to jail. The students were only fined. But he wrote us all a letter, and I'd like to share that with you. I must stand and speak for those who have no voice and those who are most vulnerable. It is never the right time. It is never convenient. But if not now, when? If not me, who? Thank you.